actually help us to understand a little bit better how to live our lives and glorify you with our bodies and with our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. So moving forward between chapters 11 and chapter 21, there's kind of a lot of uh, redundant, redundant things. And just for the sake of time, I'm going to take pieces. So we're not going to go verse by verse. But I'm going to take pieces from these chapters, and we are going to examine them. Okay. So, chapter 11. So in chapter 10, we were talking about southern Israel. Chapter 10, Joshua does an invasion of northern Israel. Oh, I forgot something. This was chapter 10, and there's no. <laughs> okay, that looks a little weird. What? That's how he sleeps. Uh, well, she, okay, he looks a little bit like the it's not <laughs> lies. <laughs> yeah, All right, so southern, southern Canaan down here is where chapter uh, 10 was. This is where they uh, took land and destroyed a lot of kings and now they're going to go north into Hazor is going to be the town that's mentioned in the chapter and they're going to take this northern area okay so I'll get back over to my okay who wants to read for us verse 4 with a loud voice full screen oh full screen um Nice and loud, Lexi. We're in chapter 11 now. This is uh, verse 4 and 5, 6, and selected parts of other verses in uh, chapter 11. Go for it. They came out with all their troops and a large number of horses and chariots, a huge army, as numerous as the sand on the seashore. All these kings joined forces and made camp together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them. Because by this time tomorrow, I will hand all of them slain over to Israel. You are to hamstring their horses and burn their chariots until no survivors were left. Joshua did to them as the Lord had directed. He hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots. They totally destroyed them, not sparing anyone that breathed. And he burned Hazor itself. Okay, so there's that town, Hazor, or Hazor. All right, who wants to look up Psalm chapter 20, verse 7? All right, set. Woo! Who's got Isaiah 31 1? All right. Trisha, Deuteronomy 17 16. Lauren, and all right, Sam, you take Exodus. All right, so let's all go there. Psalm 20, verse 7. So we're going to let this, we're going to let these scriptures tell us a little something about that passage in Joshua that we just read. Uh, and we'll start with Psalm 20, verse 7. Go Some seven. take pride in chariots and others in horses, but we take pride in the name of the Lord our God. All right, so what does that have to do with what we just read in Joshua? Actually, let's go, Tricia, with all turning to Isaiah 31, verse 1. Woe to those who go down to Egypt. Whoa, I'm not there. Woe to those who read the scripture too fast before the entire class. <laughs> Is able wow. to see. You told me to read. Did I? That, that yeah. is fair. You can't kind of say Dang it, I didn't plug my mic in yet. Sorry. Visual <laughs> learners online. Okay. So Isaiah 31 1. Is Kate there? Huh? Maddie's not there yet. Maddie. Zach is still turning. What happened to Trent, man? He just ended up in the back wall one of these days. Where, weren't she usually over here or something? Uh, all right. <laughs> all right, here we go. I'm just going to have to go back there a lot because Trent's my friend. Let's go. All right, so what's 
God saying? And Joshua, he says, I want you to hamstring their horses, burn their chariots. Don't be afraid of the fact that they have all these horses, that they have all these chariots. Um, because this t by this time tomorrow, you're going to burn those chariots. What's going on? Blake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, how do you take that on April 26th, 2023? How does, what do we put our trust in? What are the chariots and horses of 2023? Yeah, I was thinking about my forerunner. My forerunner. I realize needs brakes or brake pads starting to squeak in the morning whenever I put it in reverse. What? Really? Uh, yes. Sometimes. <laughs> All right. What? But, but you said wealth as well, right? Yeah. In what way do we put our trust in wealth? I'm going to get you, Kate. Are you asking? Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, so if you, you know, make a ton of money and you're like, oh, I made all this money and mm. I provide for myself mm -hmm. and I provide for my family, it's putting all the pressure on you and not giving any of the credit to God because in reality, without God, you wouldn't take any of that money because it's all God. Yeah. And what else? is God saying about putting your trust in money in this? I think you're right. But uh, what are some other ways that this, this applies? Because what he's talking about is they're going up an, against an army as vast as the sea on the seashore. This is like talking about, in the context of money, Bill Gates or the richest people in the world. You're going up against those guys. It would be kind of scary. They have all the resources on their side. And God says in Isaiah 31, Woe to those who rely on horses, who trust in chariots, because they are many. But do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor seek the Lord. Yeah, Alexi. Yeah. Money's good. Chariots are okay for getting from point A to point B. But when it comes to warfare, when it comes to the things that are really important, when it comes to, it says, things like Judgment Day, this could be called a Judgment Day for these uh, cities, money does not save in the Day of Judgment. Um, Deuteronomy 17, 16. Who's got that one? All right, Lauren. Um, okay, the king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way. <coughs> okay, so did you guys catch this one? Deuteronomy 17, 16. He's saying Egypt was known for their horses, and that's where everybody went to go get horses, to get these resources, and they... God says, I don't want you to acquire a lot amount. I don't want the king of Israel to acquire large amounts of horses. I don't want you to acquire these kind of resources. It's almost like God's saying, I don't want you to go make a deal with these people who are going to lead you astray. What's that? Mm -hmm. Because... The temptation is to put our trust into these other things. All right. Um, why is this good? I'm going to skip uh, Exodus 15.4. Why is this good um, for us?
Yes. Um, say it, say that one more time. It helps us to know that um, whatever we face in life, no matter what, like we'll be able to conquer it because we have God. And like in all these verses, it's talking about how God is more powerful than money, more powerful than the most powerful people in the world. Mm -hmm. What are the things that you guys look to to give you security? Sorry, what were you going to add to that, Nick? Uh, I was just going to, I don't know, I was going to add to kind of what you were saying. Mm -hmm. question. Just reading, saying, reading the Bible, and just 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 reading the Bible, It's a, it's a testimony to the surrounding nations of who God is. So I think one of the things that I think about, uh, I agree with that um, answer. This, this scripture, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10 says, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. Uh, where is Oh, there it is. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest on me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, I think there is a reality where we can quench God's spirit when we are really strong. When we are really at our best. There is, it's really easy to go in our own power and to go in our own strength. Uh, and Paul is like, yes, I'm going to jail. Yes, I am getting beat up. Yes, I'm poor. Yes, all these bad things are happening. Not like probably as excited as I am right now because he's like limping along. But he is saying, okay, God is going to come through. God is going to make something happen out of this poverty, out of this brokenness, out of this situation that seems hopeless. God will bring about and show his power. He says, when I am weak, then God's power starts to get activated. That's when all of a sudden there starts to be something going on that is outside of me, that's outside of uh, my solution to the situation. Uh, okay, let's move on. Can I add to that? Mm -hmm. So I've personally experienced this. You know, I had a really bad back for quite a few years, but I wanted to teach preschoolers. Preschoolers, it's a little bit physical. Yeah. And literally every week I was just like on, in my heart, on my knees going, help me, God, I need your help. Because yeah. I don't have a strength like he wasn't going to give me the strength he did and that was a testimony to me and to so many other people and it grew my faith mm. so I think that's like a product from this happening yeah you can always look back on that and be like God got me through this situation that I didn't think I could get through yeah did I see someone else Maddie can you go back two verses it's exactly what he's talking about he's like Mm -hmm. I with God to take it away. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. Mm -hmm. So it was like, exactly what she was talking about. More of like, mm -hmm. exactly yeah. Like yeah. It's, uh, it's definitely one of those things where, you know, you guys may find yourself at a point in your life where uh, you, you're at the end of yourself and it's very frustrating. 
and humiliating, but uh, know that God's power is at work in those situations. Um, let's uh, read verse 14 and 15. Who can, who can read this one? Let's go, Maddie. This is chapter 11, yeah. All right. I want to focus on this verse 15 and just real quickly, who can grab John 7, 16, and 18, 16 through 18? All right, Maddie. Let's all go there for this one. Give a clap when you're there. All right, Maddie. You got it. So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true and in the name of falsehood. All right. So, Joshua did... Everything Moses commanded him to do. The scripture says, Jesus says, I do not teach my teaching. I am teaching the teaching of the one who sent me. Colby, what are we reading? I am doing the teaching of the one who sent me. This is not my message. God sent me to send this message. And then he says, whoever seeks to do the will of God he's going to find out that my teaching is from God. So he says, once you step out and start doing these things, and we could, we could put this in Joshua's case, once you step into the River Jordan and it parts, you will know that God is the one that is telling you to do these things. You will know when you start fighting the battle by walking around the city seven times and the walls fall down. You will know when you step out in faith that these things are, in fact, the things that God says to do. So the next thing he says is anyone who speaks the words that someone sends him to speak or the one who seeks the glory of the one who sends him, that person is not lying. That person's telling the truth. That person is a man of, of truth. There is no falsehood in them. What do, you guys, what do you guys take from that? Joshua goes into the promised land and he's... This scripture that we just read said he did everything that Moses told him to do. Colby, what do you think? So, when I was in uh, advertising, that's kind of what the filmmaking stuff that I did was. And in that, right, there's a billion filmmakers out there. And it's competitive, right? Everybody wants to be the person that gets the contract to do, uh, say, the next Nike commercial or the next Adidas commercial or the next this or the next that, right? And so we have all these ideas as filmmakers. This is the way I want to tell the story. This is the kind of film that I want to make. I want to get this kind of camera. I want to get an octocopter, put the camera on the thing and shoot the thing that I want to shoot. Or I want to do these interviews and tell this story, right? So we have our agenda. Oftentimes though, you'll get hired and there's a person hiring you, say it's Red Bull, and they say, this is the story we want you to tell. And it's not the story that you want to tell. Right? In fact, it feels like it's going to ruin your career to go the direction that the person hiring you is telling you to go. Because you're like, man, this is not the way to tell a good story. This is not the way, right way to do this or that. And sometimes they are wrong. But what is Jesus saying here? He's saying, 
don't try to force your message. Don't try to force your way, but do the things, say the things that the person who is sending you is telling you to say. So one time, my dad was doing a discipleship uh, breakfast with a bunch of guys in our church, and I uh, was there, and I had all these ideas of what I thought I should do with my day that day. It was a Saturday. And at the end of the, the breakfast, he's like, this is the number of a guy who I want somebody to go. He was a, uh, like a conservative political activist. He would go around in the streets of L.A. and tell people about how um, you know, some of the laws were hurting businesses or hurting this group. I can't remember specifically. But he was uh, you know, involved in politics and activism. And I could go home and like go surf or clean my house or whatever. But my dad's like, I want somebody to go and just do whatever this guy wants you to do. Just go do whatever. And I was like, all right, fine. My dad's the pastor. He wants to reach out to this guy. I'll just go and see what happens. And as a result of that, I ended up meeting another guy at the political thing that was going on, and we ended up talking about Christ. That guy ended up coming to the church and getting involved in our church. And I was just like, okay, God, give me a pastor and have him tell me what to do. Give me a pastor and have him command my life. Because all the ideas that I have about what I need to do are wrong. But something happens when you have a pastor, when you have a leader, and you just simply say, whatever they tell me to do, even though it's not what I want to do, that's what I'm going to do. They want me to go uh, you know, hand out flyers at Walmart. They want me to do this. Get a pastor and just do what they tell you to do. That's what I think this scripture in John 17. Jesus says, I'm here on earth. And I'm telling you exactly what the Father is telling me to tell you. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not here telling you what my opinion is or anything like that. All right. So, verse 20. Who wants to read this one? Let's go, Sam. For it was the Lord himself who hardened their hearts to wage war against Israel, so that he might destroy them totally, exterminating them without mercy as the Lord had commanded Moses. All right. So this is kind of a throwback to what we talked about last class. You guys remember? But I was talking to uh, Kirk, our guest speaker, and I thought we might answer this question again. How could it be that a loving God would harden hearts so that no mercy would be shown to a group of people? Okay. So I'm going to answer this question using... Dirk's uh, philosophical approach, okay? So I gave you a different answer last time. So why must God destroy some societies? If it were in your power to stop, do you guys understand this word gratuitously? No? No? So it's like excess. Gratuitous is like for no reason. Right? You can eat a, f- uh, a piece of pizza, two pieces of pizza, you're full. But if you're going to eat 17 pieces of pizza, at some point, one of those pieces of pizza becomes pointless. Right? It's gratuitous. Okay? So that's an important word for this talk. If it, is in your, if it were in your power to stop a gratuitously evil society, would you do it? That means a society that it has pointless evil. Or would you decide to let the evil, injustice, and suffering spread like an unleashed disease into the future and to other societies, resulting in a much more evil world? Do you guys get the question? The disease. Mm-hmm. Is this an interesting question to you guys? No? Uh, is it possible that a perfectly good, all-powerful, and all-knowing God requires 
the destruction of a society if it becomes sufficiently evil. So the non-theist, like the atheist premise is that a perfectly good, all-knowing, and all-powerful God cannot permit gratuitous evil, where gratuitous evil is an event or set of events that neither brings about greater good nor prevents a greater evil, it is pointless, right? So sometimes there is evil that happens, and someday, time down the road, it's going to bring about a good, right? Um, so it's not preventing evil, or it's not producing a good. Another way of saying that is the evil has no net negative, or has a net negative moral value. The world is worse for it. So the premise proposed by the atheist has implications, and that is if God cannot permit a set of events that qualify as pointless evil, what happens when an entire society or culture becomes a gratuitous evil? So do you guys see these? A perfectly good, all-knowing, all-powerful God must not permit gratuitous evil. A society results in gratuitous evil if its net moral value is negative. And so then, God, uh, do you guys understand this, this point? If a society becomes so evil that it's, ne it's not going to produce anything good down the line, it's not going to ever, uh, there's not going to be anything good that will come out of it that will balance it out, nor is anything bad going to be avoided by it, its existence, then a good God um, will terminate it. Um, this is Genesis 15, 16. In the fourth generation, he's talking to Abraham. Your descendants will come back here for the sin of the Amorites has not reached its full measure. So he's saying it has not reached a point where it's gratuitous evil. Uh, this also happened to Israel. This will also happen at the end of time. So the, the question is a good question uh, because the next, the next slide, so our objections, and so the second question, can we know if a culture has become gratuitously evil? How do we know as people where, when that point is? And I don't think we can know. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know if we could know that Babylon or these other ones, but the Bible seems to tell us that these societies in Canaan were that way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I think that when, obviously God let power take over Israel, but they had not reached their point of the two the, the, that, pow the powers that took over, or I, Israel? The powers that took over yeah. Israel were not at that point yet, and we only know that because God told us so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it also says that Israel would become worse than the nations that they took over. So things got really bad. Um, that's just the only nation that he did not, is it not the only nation he did not completely destroy from doing that thing? Because they were his people. Uh, Israel? So I want to pull up Exodus 23, 28 through 30. Who can grab that? All right, Keely. I saw Keely first, Zach. You can get the next one. Exodus 23, 28 through 30. I'm there. So what this is talking about is that there was a dispersion of the people of Canaan before the Israelites went into the land. So uh, this is a point that uh, Kirk makes in his paper, but basically what it's saying is 
the land was slowly being, you know, evacuated as the Israelites came in because God's saying, so, so when it says they, they killed everybody, it's ki all the people who were left, but a lot of people had already left, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, 1 Corinthians 4, 5 and, and Romans 12, 19 through 21 are talking about how we don't have the knowledge to be the ones who take wrath or judgment. So like Romans 12, 19 through 21 is, says, vengeance is mine, it is mine to repay. So the job of identifying what nations should be destroyed is God's job, not our job. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's God showing us what it looks like when he doesn't take care of the gratuitous nations and just how the whole world became evil? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it seems like it. Uh, yeah. I mean, and that's a situation where God is doing the, um, the judging and not like his yeah. people or a, group or a people group. All right, I wanted to show you guys this video. This is an archaeological find in southern Israel uh, that shows what was going on. Oh, man. Is it not playing? Shoot. It should be playing. There we go. It's not working. <laughs> Our boy. Uh, all right. Let's try this. It's probably going to have an ad now. Boo. No, come on. do with my iPhone. I don't think it's going to work. All right. Sorry, guys. Yeah. So basically, at this, um, at this, uh, Do you want to try it from that TV? Sure. If what what would you do, Coop? Just 
Do you want me to reconnect or disconnect? I don't know why it just goes away as soon as when I hit it. Um, so basically, what the what the video shows is that um, there it's there's a Canaanite high place that was excavated in southern Canaan, and at that high place, they find pots, like these containers, with baby remains uh, where they, babies have been burned. Um, this is what the Amorites did. They uh, sacrificed their children uh, to the god Molech. They also found uh, a snake, a bronze snake. Uh, yeah, Nick? So it's on a hilltop uh, in, um, I believe it's Geezer is the name of the, the city. But it's, it's on a hilltop. So many of these, um, you know, places of worship were on top of hills. And so they sacrificed their children to the god uh, Molech there. And that is... Um, yeah, so Israel would end up doing the same thing. And today in America, I would argue that, you know, abortion is the same sin, just with a different way of enacting the uh, sin. So, um, you know, this... Uh, situation just pops up over and over in history. You got it? Okay, yeah. If you can play it. I only want to show the first four. So can you go back to the beginning of the video? This is like three or four minutes in, I think. That's not the beginning, is it? And so he began excavating the air. Beginning in 1902, the British archaeologist Stuart McAllister began excavating at Gezer. On the Acropolis of the site, McAllister noticed that there was a row of stones whose tops were protruding through the ground. And so he began excavating the area and unearthed 12 standing stones in a row. And next to them was another huge stone with a flat top and a basin carved into it. And as he was uh, excavating this area, he realized that he was digging a Canaanite high place where the ancient inhabitants of the city had worshipped their gods. Now what McAllister found next around these standing stones is deeply disturbing. However, it shouldn't be surprising because it was evidence for a Canaanite worship practice that is described in the Bible. Uh, I don't have the remote. The city of Gezer is mentioned in the Bible several times and is located in Israel between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Discovered the skeletons of young infants. 
They were deposited in large jars, and the skeletons showed marks of fire. They started finding all over the place here, around the base of these pillars, jars with burned human babies inside of them. Okay, and this is from his excavation report. You can see the skeletal remains of a burned baby inside of the jar. Buried ritually. Not just buried, but buried ritually. Now, how are they buried ritually? They're buried in a, in a place of sacrifice, in a sacred place of worship. So in his excavation report, McAllister made a plan of the high place from the perspective of looking straight down. And then on this top plan, he marked with the letter J everywhere where he had found these infant jar bearings. See all the J's, J, 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 see all the J's, jar burial with not just baby bones in them, burned baby bones in them. Okay, this is about a seven, six, seven year old girl that was cut in half. You can tell, by the way, when they're cut um, in half because you have a cut mark right through the vertebrae, right through the bones. Below this area, McAllister discovered a cave. And when his team cleared it, a black stone was found at the center of the cave. Still lying upon it were the remains of the skeleton of a human infant. I know this is sobering. I know you're not having a good time. But you either want to know what's actually found in the ground or you don't. And it's important to know what's actually found in the ground. So essentially, for McAllister, it was like excavating a crime scene. What happened here? What was going on? And so he had the evidence, but he still needed to interpret it. And what McAllister used to interpret what he found in the ground was the Bible. No. Cool. That's good. So he's basically going to, you know, the, the video goes on to talk about a lot of the stuff we have already talked about. Um, so I wanted you guys to see that just so you know. When we're talking about an evil society, this is one of the things that they did, along with all kinds of, uh, I don't know the right word to describe it, uh, lewd sex acts, uh, incest. Um, and so if you want to know more about it, read Leviticus chapter 18. Um, but the, the statement that I think, or the thing that I, um, I think we should take away is that there's only one rescue from the wrath of God, and that is and there's only one rescue from our own sinful nature, and it is Jesus, God himself, become human to pay the debt for our sin and replace our sinful nature with his life, his spirit, his word, his nature. So um, this kind of stuff is happening in the world today. I went to Uganda to film a video for Compassion, where you know you support a child every month. Uh, you know, to get a child out of poverty. And I spoke with, you know, a Compassion Center uh, director, and there's still child sacrifice happening there in Uganda. And so it, it's happening all over the world. It's happening here in America. Um, and so we need Jesus. All right. Uh, what was the next thing? Yeah. We'll, we'll end it there for today. Thanks, Cooper, for pulling that up. Um, and I'll pray. Lord, this is uh, sobering information and uh, difficult to hear, Lord, but I pray that we might take it and use it as motivation and incentive to seek your face, to pursue a relationship with you, to pursue a deep relationship with you, to be passionate about your gospel and the rescue that you've provided. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Indeed.